make plenty of mistakes, so I'm not judging. Hey, um, I want to know just for fun how many people actually looked at 8.1 last night. I read it. I love y'all so much. I didn't do it before because I forgot. Well, that was kind of the intention. The reason that we had to go ahead and talk about 8.1 before test one is we had a data field if we were going to um, wait until Tuesday to take the test. And in calculus, we don't have a day we can twiddle our thumbs. So we did 8.1, which was mostly a review of everything that we had done in Chapter 5, except for, um, this is page 519, two little tricks at the end. Really? And two of those were you? Yeah, only two. Actually, I don't even trigonometric identities. We might have thought to use uh, Pythagorean identity to change one plus C. See, y'all have me afraid to say anything out loud now because it's going a mistake. <laughs> y'all will be telling all the other teachers. No, Miss Miles no. said sine squared minus cosine squared is one. No, no. Oh. I love you. We would never. <laughs> um, yeah, that's not your anyway. I think, <laughs> don't you want to you know what that means? You can make jokes about hyperbolic functions. I do it Okay, so I don't even really call use trigonometric identities anything new, except for we didn't run into very many problems where that was necessary. The thing that was new, and I would no, not have ever have even thought to use it, was multiply by the Pythagorean uh, conjugate. Really? Who thought of that? I can see why, once I do a problem, I can see that when I multiply by the Pythagorean conjugate, that gives me a Pythagorean identity in the denominator, and um, that gives me a monomial denominator, and if I have a monomial denominator, then I can split into two fractions. So once I saw it, I went, that's a cool tool for the toolbox, but I would not have thought of it. All right, so it was my hope, and even with y'all, it would be my expectation, but um, probably not with any other class yet, that you would look at homework on a test day. By the way, I didn't get those tests graded yet. Um, I graded my college algebra test, but I was in a meeting in here until 6 last night and then got home and had to think about what we're doing today, make sure I could still um, integrate my parts. So if, I, I'm not going to, we don't have another day to talk about 8.1, but if you do what's on the 8.1, oh, there wasn't an 8.1 handout. This was the homework that I gave you that day. So look at those problems in 8.1, and if you have any questions about them, then we can go back and look at some. Okay? All right. New stuff. New, new, new. You know, I've thought about that. I. He's like, what does it do for us? I guess we don't rotate anything else around the any axis the rest of the semester. Yay! So I'm not sure. I'm sure. I'm not sure why it is where it is in the book. Um, normally, I can make a case for let's go in the book order. I mean, the author had a reason for putting it in this order. This. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why we let our integration skills get just a, a little bit rusty while we're rotating things around axes and then go back to integration. I'm not sure, but that's a discussion for another time. All right. I like my title here. Integration by parts is the own product rule. We've known for most of our lives that we could take derivatives term by term, but you can't take derivatives factor by factor. You want to take the derivative of A times B. You can't just take the derivative of A and the derivative of B. You have to use the product rule. So um, speaking of product rule, if I do take the derivative of a product, UV, with respect to X, then it's the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. We were born knowing that. Um, Alternate notation on the second line here, if I, if on the first line I was differentiating with respect to x, then for dv over dx, I'll just put v prime, and for du over dx, I'll just put u prime. So the product rule, um, we more often use this notation than that notation, u v prime plus v u prime. And if we integrate both sides, then we should get back what we started with. That's the whole point of integration. 
So integrate both sides with respect to x. Well, the uh, antiderivative of the derivative of uv dx, because I have to have that diff, uh, dx to be able to integrate. What's that left-hand side going to be? Antiderivative of the derivative. It's just going to be uv. Yeah, I thought I was trying to pick you, but I'm not. All right. Let me, on the right-hand side, since I know that I can differentiate term or anti-differentiate term by term, let me write that as two separate integrals and say the antiderivative of uv prime dx plus the antiderivative of the u prime dx. Yes. Yeah, try to make one of them round and one of them pointy. All right. When we talked about, do you, do you kind of remember the aha moment when you said, um, say, y prime is the same thing as dx over dy, and then you realize that the dx and the dy actually mean something, that they're the differential, if we multiply both sides by dy, we'd have the differential in x. Well, this is um, the differential in v. v prime dx is the differential in v. Yes, ma'am? See, that's like spelling when without a w. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, yes. No, it's, it's like me not being able to spell. Um, yes, it's not. Okay, yes, absolutely, and thank you. Um, it's the derivative of y with respect to x, not the derivative of x with respect to y. Absolutely. All right. So um, this v prime dx, that is the differential in v right here, and the u prime dx in the second term, that's the differential in u, that's du. So if we put dv in place of v prime dx, we have that, and if we put um, du, in place of the u prime dx. That's what we have. And then if we solve that for the antiderivative of u dv, all we have to do is what? We're solving for this. Just subtract that term. Now I'm going to move this uh, antiderivative of u dv over to the left. I'm just solving for that and then flipping the whole equation. And I get uv um, minus the antiderivative of v dv. What happened to the dx? The v prime dx was the differential in v. And the u prime dx was the differential in u. All right. So there's not a big aha moment here because, yeah, we just manipulated a bunch of stuff, but what's the point? The point is if we can get something in the form, if we can get the integrand in the form of some u times some derivative of v, then this becomes a formula for differentiating a product. And you just have to see it once to go, oh, that did just different or anti-differentiate a product. But that's what this formula is for. It's called integration by parts. If u and v are both continuous functions of x and have continuous derivatives, 
if we can write something in the form, the integral of u dv, then this right hand side is simply a formula for the integration. And all you have to do is do one problem and see that it works by checking your answer, and then all of a sudden you have a way of different anti-differentiating products, which we've never had before. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, then the integration by parts just doesn't apply. We have a lot of theorems in math that have, um, under certain conditions, this is true. And if those conditions are not met, then it doesn't say anything. It doesn't say integration by parts won't work. It doesn't say, you know, it will, it won't. It doesn't say anything if you don't meet the conditions. All right. So I have a new formula. I kind of maybe understand where it comes from. I want to see it in action. Our first example, antiderivative of x times e to the x dx. If I had never heard of integration by parts, I might start thinking about substitution. Well, let you be e to the x. Well, that's not going to work because then the anti or the uh, derivative of that, we have an unaccounted for x, and it's not like we can just use formal substitution like we did before. So nothing, uh, nothing that I knew before today allowed me to anti-differentiate that. Integration by parts, your success at integration by parts depends on picking the right U and the right DV. And there's a handy little acronym that's going to, I haven't seen anywhere, but it didn't work. Um, but I'll tell you that in a minute. Right now, I'm just going to say, for reasons known only to me, I'm going to let U be the X and then DV is going to be everything else. It's going to be the e, F, e to the x dx. So that's the two parts that I have to pick out. You determine what u is. Once you determine what u is, dv has to be everything else. And then if I have u equals x, what's du? How, or how would I find du? Yeah, that just means take the derivative of u and the derivative of x is just dx, one dx. Now, if everything else is dv, then how do I find out what v is? Integrate. So I'm not putting any little stuff here just so you'll know what we did. Um, you anti-differentiate e to the x dx. What is that? Just e to the x. So now we have four things. We have a u, we have a du, we have a v, we have a dv. And that's all this formula takes. So I'm going to rewrite this antiderivative. Now I'm looking at this, and I won't use formal substitution anymore, but I'm looking at this as being the product of some u, which is x, and some dv, which is e to the x dx. And ah, that's what the formula is for. So I'm just going to start plugging and chugging right here. The formula starts with u times v. There's my u, there's my v. So uv is x e to the x. And the formula says subtract from that the antiderivative of v du. v is e to the x, and du is dx. So that formula actually doesn't do the anti-differentiating in just one step, because I still have an indefinite integral right now. But now what I have is something that I can anti-differentiate. Just bring down that first term. And what's the antiderivative of e dx? Mm -hmm. e to the x. Mm. Ooh, plus a constant. Oh. Plus a constant. I'm not sure why I had two more equal. Oh, I had two more equals just because 
last night I wrote the formula on step two. I'm trying to, uh, there's nothing else I can do there other than I could factor out an e to the x from those first two terms. But that other equals was there because last night I wrote the formula right below the antiderivative of u and g. All right. Yay, we have an answer, but mm, not really meaningful to me until I check it and go, dang, integration by parts just worked. So let's integrate this by parts. Um, not sure what that dash is there for. That was just a typo. But if we take the derivative of e to the x times x minus 1 plus c. I know the derivative of the constant is going to be 0. How do I take the derivative of the other part? Yeah. The first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. And when it all cleans up, what does it have to be in order for this to check? that I started with, x e to the x. Let's see if it is. Maybe e to the x plus x e to the x minus e to the x. Let's complete it. I'm going to finish what that part was supposed to be. I'm pretty sure. Because this is a math class on something. All right. Um, it worked. Certainly proving that it worked on one example doesn't prove that it works on all examples. But unless you go to graduate school and take advanced calculus one and two, you, you don't have to prove that it works for all examples. That's what I had to do in advanced calculus one and two. Take everything that I learned in calculus one through four and prove it all. It was horrible. I'm so glad I did it. Otherwise, I wouldn't know you folks. Aww. Okay. I said that success at integration by parts depends on choosing the right you. Once you, once you choose you, everything else is pretty much set. You choose you. Everything else has to be dv. You differentiate to find du. You integrate to find b. And then you plug it all into the formula. But if you pick the wrong U, you're just going to get something that doesn't work. Luckily, like I said, there's an acronym that hasn't failed me yet. But let's say I didn't know that acronym yet. And I said, um, let's let U be E to the X. And then DV would be everything else. DV would be the X B to the X, uh, X DX. What would DU be? E to the X. And then... Uh, v, how would I get the V? Integrate x dx. What's the antiderivative of x dx? We x squared. And we won't worry about the plus C right now because we know when we checked our answer, we'd say the antiderivative of C is 0. So that is, um, I have a U, I have a DU. I have a V and I have a DV. So I have everything I need for the formula. And I can write antiderivative of x e to the x dx as the, um, u times v. u is e to the x. v is 1 half x squared. That's u times v. Then minus the antiderivative of v, which is 1 half x squared, dv, which is, um, no, du, I'm sorry, du, which is e to the x. That's my u, that's my v, that's my um, v, and that's my du. Or I don't realize there's a problem. 
That's why I take one more step. That's one half x squared e to the x minus, I know I can go ahead and bring that uh, constant factor out in front, one half the antiderivative of x squared e to the x. Is that any better than what I started with? No, I started with x to the first e to the x. Now I have x squared e to the x, or dx. I don't want to leave off my dx. Um, I don't see that as being helpful. And so if you pick the wrong u, um, integration by parts may lead to something that's no easier to integrate than what you originally had. Now today, we got two days to do integration by parts. Today, they all pretty smooth. Tomorrow, we have to integrate by parts once, and then we have to integrate by parts again. It's gonna you're gonna need some sandwich. So if you have, no, I'm sorry. Oh, thank God! I didn't need an excuse for this. For no, months. no, 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 no. And kid. Okay. Um, <laughs> you told 16 year olds that we're gonna need some. I'm 17, thank you. <laughs> and then I said, I'm oh, kidding. You don't need um, Okay, let me show you these two things, and tell. Then I'll tell you about the fabulous acronym that hasn't let me down yet. Um, I know y'all are so eager readers. You're reading ahead, but. We have these general guidelines because every once in a while um, the acronym is not clear on a couple things. In general, let dv be the most complicated part of the integrand that we know we can integrate. If we have a 1 over 1 plus a squared, and I know I know how to integrate that, then I'm going to let that be dv, and I'm going to integrate it. I'm going to integrate the ugliest thing I can integrate. And then let u be whatever's left. You either pick your u, and everything else is dv, or you pick your dv, and everything else is u. And then dv always includes the dx, because if it doesn't, you can't integrate to get the v. second box. Um, if you just look at those three examples in number one, in all three of those examples, I would say that you, or that dv, the most complicated part, is the exponential or trigonometric part. So I would let dv be the exponential or trigonometric part, but you be the algebraic part it's easy to differentiate algebra. Uh, certainly in, well not certainly actually, um, in these three, if you just said what's the most complicated part, I would definitely say either the natural log or the inverse sine. But after a bit of practice, you're going to learn that um, if I let you be the natural log, the arc sine, or the arc tangent, exactly the complicated looking part, I can always integrate x to the n, and it's when these, when you differentiate them, they turn into algebraic, right? When we differentiate natural log or arc sine or arc tangent, they all become algebraic expressions that are easier to deal with than those expressions are. That's not true of e to the x, sine x, and cosine x. When we differentiate them, they're still transcendental. But these three, when we integrate them, they become algebraic. So I would let u be the natural log, the arc sine, or the arc tangent. And then for these two, if you have an e to the something times a trig function, let u be the trig function and let dv be the exponential function, you can integrate the exponential function all day long. All right. Now, these two boxes are in the book. My notes say what page? Page 
515 and 520, where I copied those two boxes. But here's the magic. I wish it actually spell something. It'd be easier for me to remember. But the acronym L-I-A-T-E. Like I ate late or something. I don't know. Um, that acronym, right at the top of your paper, it stands for logarithmic, inverse trigonometric, algebraic, trigonometric, and exponential. That's an acronym for choosing you. If any one of your pieces of integrand are logarithmic, then let that be you. But if you don't have any logarithms, say, do I have an inverse trig here? I don't have logarithms, but I have inverse trig. I'm going to let the inverse trig be u. If I don't have either one of those two, I'll let the algebraic portion be u. If I don't have any of those three, I'll let the trigonometric portion be u. And if I don't have any of those first four, I'll let the exponential part be u. All right, so just write L-I-A-T-E at the top of the paper. Spelling does matter there. <laughs> you, you can probably arrange. It's not like full that you can do it in any order. This is a specific order of things that you look for to let you do. All right. So let's do as many examples as we can in about 25 minutes. Blank page, blank page. Oh, Sam. Sam was the only person whose test I got graded because he handed it to me my, before my college algebra folks started handing me tests. I thought I lost that. I couldn't find it. There it is. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to make it. The rest of them I will get tonight. Um, okay. So. Here's my best friend that I can't pronounce. According to that acronym, what's the first one of those things that I have? Mm -hmm. I don't have a logarithmic, I don't have an inverse tree, but the algebraic portion is 5x. So I'm going to let u be 5x, and then automatically um, dv is everything else. So what's dv? 1 over e to the 2x or e to the negative 2x, doesn't matter. Uh, don't forget the dx, because without the dx, you can't integrate the dv. Once you choose u, everything else is set. So what's du? Five dx. And if dv is e to the negative two x, then v is going to be the antiderivative of that. And in order to integrate e to the negative two x. What am I going to have to have beside it? Negative 2 dx, and how could I make that equivalent to the line above it? Negative 1 half out front. All right, double check. Is that equivalent to the line above it? Yes, it is. Um, is this in the form e to the u with the derivative of the u right beside it? Yes. So what is v? So good. And we like formulas. Just give me a formula. I can plug and chug all day long. 
this original integral. Can be written as, I'm going to write, and I'm not going to write the formula. Um, it won't take you long to get memorized. U times V is 5X times negative 1 half E to the negative 2X. That's my U. That's my V. Minus the integral of V DU. B cleans up to negative 5 halves x e to the negative 2x. Why could you, why could you do that second term? Yes. Mm -hmm. I would bring the constant negative 5 halves out front and minus a negative would be plus 5 halves times the integral of e to the negative 2x dx but to integrate e to the negative 2x what do I have to have right beside it? And negative 2 and what's the only way that's equivalent to the line above it? A negative one half that barely squeezes in front of that integral. Negative five halves x e to the negative two x. Then what? This is just e to the u with the u right beside it. So the antiderivative is e to the negative 2x. And then, just to make uh, one of the two tables go, ah, and go factor out a fractional coefficient. <laughs> I'm going to factor out not only a negative 5 fourths, but what else could I factor out? Alright, negative 5 fourths e to the negative 2x, what would that leave me of the first term? Mm -hmm. Write down what you think, and then check it. Does negative 5 fourths times 2 give you negative 5 halves? Yes, it does. What else? Oh, it needs the x too, right. And if I'm factoring out a negative 5 fourths e to the negative 2x from that second term, what's left? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yes. And it always matters. In differential equations, in differential equations, it always matters because you're going to be given some initial conditions to find what that constant is. Um, so yes, I need a plus C right there, a plus C right here. I'm so happy you got this far. That's absolutely 100% fine. Um, I might write it. Remember, good old single fraction factor is completely impossible. <laughs> We're way past that. <laughs> I'm so happy if you finish, you know, if you get to that point, you just tickle me to death. But I would probably write it as that. What do you think about that?
How's that? It can always get worse. So maybe I'll tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It won't tonight. Huh? Oh yeah. The second would be natural log of x in parentheses squared with x in the denominator. Or am I looking at the wrong thing? Number what are you? Using? Oh, that's right. Uh, t times the natural log of t plus 1. Yeah. See, at first glance, I don't think it looks bad, but that's how calculus is. Something can not look bad. I think it yeah. Okay. Let's not scare people who haven't looked at it yet. Oh, oh, I do want to tell, oh, look at the directions. This is important, and I write it out part of it, but I still remember what it said. Um, solve by the simplest method. Not all require integration by part. <laughs> because you're learning to distinguish what's the easiest kind to do on this one, what's the easiest kind on this one. Now it may be, and I don't know because I haven't looked at 19 yet, it may be that there was an easier way to do that problem other than integration by parts. But if not, we'll, we'll worry about that tomorrow. You know, free worry about anything. Um, don't forget that though. Every once in a while, you encounter a problem that you go, I don't need integration by parts for that. Well, if you see that, don't do integration by parts. That's what we're learning, finding the best way to do the problem. So number 18, you can probably think of what made me interrupt myself to say that. Number 18. No, I have Oh, you see another one? No, I think Yeah, that you can uh-huh. Oh my gosh, piece of cake. Can you believe that's so easy and obvious to you now? <laughs> um, U is 1 over T, and then DU would be what? No, I mean, I'm not doing integration by parts. Yeah, I think I can do this without integration by parts if I let U be 1 over T then du is what? Yes, I'm seeing if you remember the negative. That's t to the negative 1, so when you differentiate it, you get negative 1 t to the negative 2, or negative 1 over t squared, which is pretty much what we have there, except for the negative. To integrate this, I need e to the u Up here where I wrote DU, I should have put a DT on that. This is E to the U, and this is the derivative of U right beside it. And what's that lack in being equivalent to line above it? Yep. Now that that's in the form, um, e to the ugly with the derivative of ugly right beside it. What's the antiderivative of e to the ugly d ugly? Ta-da! And the moral of that problem is, before you try an integration by parts, look and see if something you already know will work because that was easier than integration by parts. I could have probably done it by integration by parts, but why would I want to if I didn't have to? All right, another one that does beg for integration by parts. Do you see anything else that would work? Like, um, if I let u be 3x, I don't see that helping. If I let u be natural log of 3x, I don't see that helping. So I, don't, I wouldn't think of anything else that I could do. And then I drag out integration by parts. I look up at my acronym, and the first thing I notice that that integrand has is what? Something before that. Oh, it has a logarithmic portion. 
So let the logarithmic portion be u. And that makes sense because when I take the derivative of the logarithmic portion, it becomes algebraic. And I love it when transcendental it becomes algebraic. That's the ultimate t-shirt. Let u be the natural log of 3x. And then dv has to be everything else, which just happens to be easy to integrate. Yay! And if u is natural log of 3x, what's dv? the derivative of the u, and the derivative of u is what? Oh. So that's just 1 over x, the free cancel. Um. 1 over x dx. And if dv is x to the fifth dx, then v is the antiderivative of that. And what's the antiderivative of that? of x to the fifth natural log of 3x dx. Is u times v, 6x to the sixth times natural log of 3x. Minus the antiderivative of v dv. The more you practice, the more you're going to start skipping a few steps, but the minute you start missing problems because you're skipping steps, it's time to stop skipping steps. And I'm not going to skip steps in my notes. That gives v, that gives v. Anything I can do to clean up the first time? No, not really. You said multiply both sides by six to clear out the fractions I've tried. <laughs> hmm. About cleaning up that in grand. about it as multiplying by x to the negative 1. Um, I think about it as x to the 6 divided by x to the 1st. Either way, we get x to the 5th, which, yay, is something that you can anti-differentiate on the next line. Yes, ma'am. Are you okay before I started using the formula? Yeah. Okay, then let me label this. Um, that was u. And this is V. I put it VU instead of UV. And this is the antiderivative of V. VU. I 
could multiply those and call that coefficient 1 over 36, but in, since I'm fixing to factor out a, you know, I'll factor out a 1 over 36, and what else? Mm -hmm. 1 over 6, x to the 6, what would that leave me from the first term? I said 36, but I put my thing to yeah, what does that leave me the first term? Yeah. That check if you multiply it back real quickly. Yeah. And I'm factoring out the negative 1 over 36x to the 6. So all that's going to be left of that second term is minus 1. And I can either have the plus C inside the brackets or outside the brackets. Inside the brackets will be a different constant. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just a constant. And if you give me some um, initial information about X and whatever, whatever, I can find that constant. So I would leave it like that. Um, I don't particularly, I don't think particularly see any reason to rewrite that. Um, would this be the same thing? Put the 6 back as the exponent of the 3x. There's no reason I have to do that. It's absolutely fine. Um, I don't need the brackets anymore because it was this. Oh, wait. Yes, I do. The x to the 6 was outside. Oh, thank you, Emma. get uglier is the ones, the uh, definite intervals, 43 to 52. They were ugly just because of the fundamental theorem of calculus. You know, it just takes a little while to do that. Um, 24 is worse, so we're not looking at that today. You want to see a whole page of integration by parts? No, this is... This is two or five problems. <coughs> Someday you'll look at that and go, I, I can't believe that ever made sense to me. That's And very little white out. There's some white out up there. Um, no, I remember one time y'all asking, you know, can we see your calculus two notebook? I said, I, I don't want to make you cry at this point this in your life. This is this is it. I don't know. I might have burnt them. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other course I made a B in. Advanced calculus two. It's tennis. <laughs> that, that B in tennis keeps me humble. Um, let me see. I don't think you necessarily have to see another one. That was um, 22 is nothing worse. 24 is worse, but not today. 26. Uh, 26, I did integration by parts. 28, yep, not bad. 46. I remember doing it last night. It wasn't bad. Number 52 is only harder because it's a definite integral. And you don't even write this down. You can take a picture if you want to. But um, it wasn't the integration by parts that was difficult. That stopped right there. It was the fundamental theorem of calculus and the clean up, clean up, clean up as much as you can. That took several more lines. Okay. Enough to try some tonight and drink extra coffee tomorrow. Right. Integration by parts twice. And there's another thing for. <laughs> You're such a nerd. 
All right. Um, that's all. And on the handout, I have which ones. It's not like they put them in increasing order from easiest to hardest like mo most hard homeworks are. I can tell you right where the hard part start starts and that's where you stop the first day. Um, this got the hard parts mixed in with the easier ones. So for tonight, I have three, six, seven problems. You, you can email me because you do such a good job of attaching a picture of your work and asking a specific question. Yeah. I understand this until line seven. And <laughs> All righty. See ya. Um, I will. I have to leave Kalanon today at eleven thirty. But y'all, yeah, y'all, y'all shouldn't have anything to ask me yet. Yeah. Um, See you, Samuel. You know what? Do I need to stop the recording? Yeah.